Welcome everybody uh, to the uh, final of our Nonfiction Lab Public Forum series for 2021. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'd just like to begin. I'm David Carlin. I'm one of the co-directors of the Nonfiction Lab. So um, welcome to everybody who's who's joining us here today from wherever you are in Melbourne, around the country or internationally even. And um, I'd like to begin. I'm joining from Boliki Beck near the banks of the of, of the Merry Creek uh, into the north of, of Nam, Melbourne. And I'd like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung uh, people and the Boonwurrung language group as well of the Eastern Kulin Nation on whose lands um, I'm joining this um, event today from. And you, you might like to also put in the chat if, if you would like to where you are joining us from. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to, to, to their elders, um, past, present and emerging and acknowledge also that this is unceded sovereign Aboriginal land, always was, always will be. And I respectfully uh, acknowledge um, ancestors and elders, yeah. Um, so this, our last forum for the year is titled, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, Meaningful Irreverence and Other Ha-Has in the Hallowed Halls, hosted by Peter Murray and Stacey Taylor, with guests Denise Chapman, Emily Gray, and Kerry Han. And I think now it is my great pleasure to hand over to the co-hosts of the event, Peter Murray and Stacey Taylor. Good afternoon, I'm Dr. Stacey Taylor, and I'm Dr. Peter Murray. The unpanel, the stand up lecture, and the performative essay are part of a new wave of alternative approaches through which contemporary research is shared. A, a rhetoric of engagement and impact underscores these playful attempts to reach broader and more curious publics, such as you good selves. In this forum this afternoon, we're going to hear from scholars uh, who are using these maverick modes of discourse to expand methods and worldviews while bringing some much needed levity to the academy. As Dr Murray said, we are facilitating a stellar panel of mavericks and game changers. So we don't have much time to share with you the maverick game changing we do ourselves. So we will attempt to introduce the forum's TCCs, that is three core concepts, ignobling for impact or IFI, weasel speaking or WS, and nitpicking or NP. We shall do this through the medium of PowerPoint and its many affordances, prepare to be amazed. Amazement coming. Amazement on its way. A little bit of amazement. How's that amazement? Now, before we move too deeply into this, just a content warning, read the content warning. We are the Jolly Good Fellows, Dr. Peter Murray and Dr. Stacey Taylor. We did our PhDs together. We both graduated together in 2016. We have since then go, gone on to do lots of very serious groundbreaking research. Here is some of our literature. Now, meanwhile, we have done the micro-credential as part of one of our compliance models for PowerPoint connectivity, and we have learned that it is not good practice to put too much text on a slide. This should make it more readable for you. You're welcome. Now, as we flag, we have three concepts to really share with you today as a, as a part of um, the, the lead up to this panel. The first is this idea of ignobling for impact. Now, this is a very delicate juggle for the academic who must somehow go through the kind of ignominy of serial grant uh, um, applications in order to try to position themselves for the recognition on the global stage that their research so firmly deserves. So these are some of the kinds of potential exposures that we could all hope for if we can get that calibration just right. 
The other two key concepts of this forum cannot be discussed without each other. We present to you weasel speaking, which makes itself vulnerable to nitpicking. I shall be unpacking and analysing weasel speaking. Dr Murray, learned colleague, will then take you through nitpicking. Weasel speaking is something that is required of us, aka corporate speak. It has crept into the academy and now is a mainstay of grant applications, promotion applications, any application, application for your Mikey. Over two years of the pandemic, I took it upon myself to collect some of this weasel speak on the slide during meetings, which is why my pending ethics application is unlikely to be approved. Now, as said, I have completed the PowerPoint connectivity micro credential and therefore I have learned that it's much better to, for you to absorb information through a diagram. So here's one some of you may be prepared, um, uh, familiar with and prepared with. You should be prepared with it. Um, if you haven't seen this before, for those at the back, please take this in and do stop immediately if you are a transgressor. Now, nitpicking. Uh, for those who are outside of the uh, aficionado crowd here, NIT stands for the National Interest Test. And these days, uh, most funding applications have to be um, measurable against this notion of the national interest test. So uh, prepare to be exposed if your research should be deemed to be frivolous, uh, pointless, done already, or otherwise irrelevant to the national interest at this time. A PowerPoint wouldn't be a PowerPoint without some vital statistics, and here's some we prepared earlier. Lowell's per Australian dollar in periods one and two, um, featuring four teams. We believe this chart speaks for itself. And now for the theory. We are soon moving on to our um, panel of stellar presenters, but first, of course, we had to give you the contextual framework. Mm. The first of our contextual frameworks <laughs> is the uh, setting the precedence for this notion of disseminating our research through the lols. And this isn't our idea alone. This has been going on for years and years. Uh, this is just one fora in which this happens, and this is called the Bright Club. Bright Club. It was founded in 2009 in London by Steve Cross and Miriam Miller, and was once reviewed as where funny meets brains, because clearly, these two things are mutually exclusive. Me? <laughs> yes, you're right. And so this brings us to today's panel, because in order to really illustrate the value of using humour to disseminate research and share ideas, we need to move into the, uh, the realm of the applied, applied humour. And so that's why we're delighted to bring to you today three experts in this field. But before we do, we have one final invitation for those of you watching. And this brings us to our final of the conceptual frameworks, <laughs> right? LOL, my thesis. <laughs> This is a uh, hashtag on Twitter and also its own website where academics and uh, PhD candidates are invited to um, express their research in one funny one liner. Here are a few again that we prepared earlier. The development of science in the 18th century was delayed because those who had the best mathematics used the wrong physics and those who had the right physics had the worst mathematics. I stuffed young rats into frosting cones and asked them how they felt. They were sad. And there are so many more. And um, we would like to invite you during the course of the presentation to think about the one liner for the thesis you wrote or might one day write. You can share these in the chat. And here are two that we prepared earlier. My PhD was called Funny Peculiar, colon, a creative practice approach to flipping perspectives for female protagonists in comedy screenwriting. But that doesn't really describe what happened. This is what happened. Tried to prove that mainstream storytelling formulae suppress women's funniness by writing a female-centered comedy screenplay using the formulae that turned out to be quite funny. And my PhD was called Essayesque Dismemoir, Rites of Elderflowering. And what that translates into is this, 
If you make up enough long, new, silly words, will they give you a PhD before you cark it? The answer is yes. And back to you and your wonderful introduction. Uh, and now it's time to bring on the experts in applied humour. So our first presenter today is Kerry Han. And in a brief performance of self, Kerry Han will attempt to explore the ontological slippage between the practice of fruitful research and the encounter of embodied experience with grounded theory in the hope of reviving the slapstick comic trope. Here's Kerry. Well, thank you. I, I, hopefully um, I, I'm appearing as a full screen. If you need to, you can press the little three dots and just highlight me. But hopefully, the, hopefully some comic tropes will, will highlight myself. Hang on, I just... But, uh, but just to reiterate um, the, uh, the acknowledgement, yes, wherever we happen to be, like, uh, with, you know, whatever region, um, we, you know, there is actually a lot of unfinished um, uh, reconciliation that, that is yet to come to it. And that's, uh, and that's kind of very serious. And like, it's hard to actually accommodate that in the framework of like uh, of something that is meant to be humorous. But hopefully like with regard to the, um, with regard to how I uh, would approach some of these things, and actually I, I, it's good to see that you're in the regalia of the uh, university, that, uh, that just to maybe to, to kind of work on the trope of, uh, of, you know, what the old style of education actually was about was basically treating people like little, little kind of uh, bricks in the coursework of, uh, you might recognize this mortarboard yeah, but the uh, the mortarboard, which is kind of you know really the really the old way the game was played. So this is the uh, the kind of you know go to the head of the class. You know, of course, you know how to go to the head of the class. You know, it's all with that apple. You know, even if it's just half the knowledge that you thought you had, it's the and, and the very wooden tasting kind of uh, knowledge. But you know, that older style of game, you know, this, as as can maybe can be seen here. This sort of you make your way closer and closer to the to the top of the class maybe shine that apple place it on the teacher's desk and if you're lucky you get to uh you know follow that high degree research as it so happened i did do a little bit of that high degree research uh, i did a phd that was entitled uh the making of a knowledge casino and just to emphasize the destabilized condition of knowledge systems i um uh submitted that in architecture and design with a thousand Wikipedia hyperlinks as the only references. Uh, they were very uh, concerned about um, the way this might destabilize the knowledge system, but, but because it happened in architecture and design, they were, they were very bricks and mortar kind of people. So it actually, uh, ha ha like luckily, was uh, was uh, accepted. Um, but anyway, this is, this is partly the, the ongoing question of how we might be able to transform you know that older system of uh, of education like the sausage factory i've even got a text reference text here sausage, sausage manufacturing um the the kind of cookie cutter approach to stamping out uh, you know individuals that are kind of ready to be or stacked in the architecture of society as kind of meaningful units which is really the older form of education now now what we're what we're now encountering is a form of well it's kind of a really like a networked a networked form of um of information distribution that is kind of wrapped in almost entirely around the head of the uh of the person being programmed almost doesn't need a um a university system at all because it's all done on these little devices that come directly to the uh to the kind of participant um but what I'd really like to, to kind of explore in this in this kind of uh, presentation is how some of those older systems, it was good to see the blackboard behind you before, some of those older systems relate to the newer systems. Okay, so we've got here, as you can see, you're looking at a very two-dimensional kind of like uh, thing. And, and even, even the kind of two-dimensional old school technology, the chalk and talk is not too far off, you know, some of the new swipe and wipe uh, you know the uh, maybe the the kind of clean slates um, neurological kind of brainwash um, as we strive for the hearts and minds of the uh, of the student. But anyway, we're, what what I'd um, also like to talk about is that shift because of the last eighteen months, where where the world has actually filled a little flatter, a bit more floppy 
uh, than it did prior to the uh, prior to the pandemic uh, beginning, um, and how we might use like tr comic tropes to be able to you know emerge from the screen, make our way from this two dimensional kind of uh, framing into a kind of like a, have, having slightly more depth of character, I guess. So I guess that that's that's kind of one of those questions is how to make it from that two dimensional to the three dimensional, and without sort of losing nuance as well, because a lot of the uh, the nuance that um, the kind of older systems of language kind of enabled, you know, the use of text has kind of been, you know, replaced by some much more kind of, uh, much more well simplified, possibly oversimplified forms of, uh, of expression. Um, and whether or not it's possible to kind of, uh, you know, um, uh, leverage some of those those processes uh, and the different systems of, of knowledge, you know, um, transfer like the uh, some of the things that do appear on these devices, but uh, rearrange them in a way to be able to may, maybe make more sense of our um, of the world we're in. Okay, like even even the kind of reflexivity that um, that. Uh, being able to draw upon mirror, mirror neurons and how uh, how we actually kind of make sense of the world. So, and, you know, in, in short, trying to transfer this into that. And it's kind of not an easy thing to do. Maybe if I do kind of like say how I try to do it is basically using, you know, metaphors. So this is like a, like okay, there's a little can of metaphor extender here. And it's it says use by, I'm not sure if there's even a date on it, but basically the just getting back to that whole network thing. So this is like a bottle in the shape of a fish. So I'm going right in there with embodied metaphor because you can sort of, with the mirror neurons and the fact that you have hands and you have kind of a body, you can imagine yourself holding a, a bottle full of water that looks like a fish. And here I'm gonna talk about Marshall McLuhan, strangely enough. And Marshall McLuhan once uh, articulated the hypermeter environment as being like asking a fish what it is that constitutes their world. You know, what is it that's most present in the world of a fish? And a fish, if a fish could speak, what would you say, fish? And it, that fish might actually not be able to even kind of communicate that it is actually like constituted by the environment of water. But I'm using this as a kind of slightly abstract metaphor to kind of then talk about the transfer of knowledge And how we how we actually do transfer knowledge and understanding. So I mean, it, it might be seem like a very kind of clunky metaphor to say like fill up a, a bottle that looks like a skull that um uh, with with you know what might might be kind of considered to be information. But in this kind of fluid and dynamic kind of world, maybe that's the best way of making things concrete. Uh, the the kind of process of using these metaphors, but also you know maybe the the kind of um. You know, yeah, the, the potential use of, of, and, and like, you know, subtle and kind of maybe not too excessive use of, um, of comic tropes to do that, partly because it enables that, well, it's what it does, it, it puts a little bit of healthy, is that possible to read? Attention, because the attention span is so limited at this point, that, uh, that using um, very uh, memorable, Kind of uh, maybe a collapse of the um, of the kind of a, or a cascaded collapse of the semiotic uh, structures. Like, is this a pipe? I think it's a pipe. I don't know. I'm not sure if it's legal to smoke inside anymore. Um, uh, or the uh, the kind of you know large things to kind of express big ideas. I mean, it's not even really useful to kind of use a light bulb incandescent like that's probably possibly illegal. Um, the uh, the kind of you know affecting the kind of you know that penny drop. Um, moment, the moment where the machine might come to life, and how to do that in a way that is actually dignifying. I mean, this is a little Wally -E computer here. Okay. And this is the kind of like environment we're now living in, like, you know, where basically um, uh, certain forms of behavioral psychology have led to us being linked up to machines that enable us to kind of, uh, you know, measure, you know, in a very clunky way whether people are actually um, uh, self-shaping uh, um, to, to fit into a st required structure. Um, and, and I think that the, the possibility of asking that about, uh, you know, how much we should be 
kind of ventriloquizing or like um, uh, basically basically like um, putting a voice into the student by by various means some of them are maybe sort of certain forms of interrogation that are kind of uh, communicated and it's kind of not the only kind of dummy that is applied because a lot of the processes that we're using these technological processes are actually t processes of pacification and uh, and Pavlovian techniques that have been dressed up in kind of cybernetic kind of uh, um, uh, systems. But if I was to come around to uh, like identifying my research and also the blind spots inherent within it, I'd say that I've been attempting to stretch my own imagination in a way that might help the things that can emerge from uh, from the mind of the next generation emerge. And I think at this point, I might be not only all through with my props, but and my sad tale of um, of like uh, of how, how the kind of education system's gone, but also just very quickly, the idea that by using absurdity, you detune in order to allow a student to retune. And as the process of tuning up requires that kind of well, um, uh, a detournment of the uh, of the rationality that we uh, know to be the kind of uh, uh, scientism that we exist within. All right, thank you for like uh, coming with me along my little kind of uh, you know, collaboration with Prof. Because I'm on, I'm on the way to um, to the VR world, and we'll catch you later. Right, cheers. Masterful, Kerry Han. Um, I would say uh, goal achieved. Goal achieved um, in ontological slippage. And it is now my great pleasure, while my learned colleague tries to um, solve the problems of the world through comedy, it's my great pleasure to introduce my friend Denise Chapman. And here is how I'm going to introduce Denise in her own words. Double speaking is her embodied practice, a method of black joy. So sit back and have a listen. These rhetorical games ain't coy. Go, Denise. Okay, I actually am seeing my my friend Megan um, actually um, highlighted. Um, so I'm I'm not sure. Am I highlighted, Megan? Give me a high five. I am. Oh, beautiful. So then I'm gonna tell my story to you. Perfect. <laughs> okay. So here we go. I would like to first acknowledge that I am on the lands of the Wurundjeri and Buurung peoples who are the custodians of this land. I acknowledge and pay my respect to their elders past and present. I acknowledge and respect their culture, cultural heritage, their beliefs, and their continued relationship to this unceded lands, its water and community, and that these connections are substantiated through oral traditions containing knowledge that should be centered. I am my ancestors. I borrow from their methodologies when I use storytelling, poetry, song, creative prose, and stitch those digital quilts. These counter narratives are meant to prepare Black children, support Black people for hegemonic discourse. My grandparents, my parents use oral stories as a means for constructing and nurturing the value of the Black spirit. These counter narratives were meant to teach us about the dominant ideologies, the oppressive structures, to avoid the media spectacle, while engendering a path towards survival. My art shines light at the intersections, at the cracks needed. The following story embodies the spirit of the trickster folktale with particular focus on trickster tales within the African-American community told during the time of slavery in the US and during the Jim Crow era, the legalized segregation that took place in the US. 
It also pays homage to critical race theory, uh, uh, the counter storytelling, uh, and in the same vein as it's in the same vein as stories uh, told with purpose, like Derek Bell's Space Invaders, or rather Space Traders, Space Traders, that is. If you haven't seen that, um, I really encourage you to go on YouTube and, and look it up and, and watch it. So while this is not a true story, I will be that I'll be sharing. It's intended to highlight oppressive structures and to be a means of creative shadow boxing. OK, a creative coded box and back, uh, a safe rhetorical play, a verbal jazz, a reinventioning or a reinvention of languaging, a critique of oppressive meaning making that focuses on issues involving power. This is my adaptation of the signifying monkey. If he was in the university. Well, now, let's gather round, whether you're up or whether you're down. I'm going to tell you a story from some scraps I done found. This story about a monkey works hard as can be, but not your usual sort of monkey. This monkey be a lecturer at a university. There's also one more thing you should know about to grow. This monkey signifies be doing the dozens a verbal play about her foe. My speaking be my embodied practice, my art, my black art, you see. So let's jump the broom, do some double speak about the signifying monkey at the university. Way down in the uni jungle. Where, 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 where? Way down in the uni jungle, filled with water, land, and tree. Lecture B Monkey was forced to update her CV. Mm. Cause every time monkeys start some writing, research, or more, hot don't mind it. Mm. Professor Lion suck up monkey's time with a roar. You see, Professor Lion was king of land, of all grasses he could see. But he was jealous of Professor Hippo, who ruled the water like a bourgeoisie. Lion had monkey hauling and collecting data with no promise, or excuse me, rather, data, hauling that data with the promise of a future stress-free, yet, Professor Lyon was fixating on having it all, not even giving monkey time for tea. Now, it's tough to make the invisible visible to those benefiting, but monkey was trying. So here's where she start thinking to start up some signifying. <clears throat> Professor Lyon, I mean Lyon, lecture monkey called out. Did you hear what Professor Hippo's been talking all about? Been going around talking, I sorry to say, about all your work in a scandalous way. Mm. Yeah, she talking about your research, your leadership, Twitter feed too. And she sure don't show no respect for you. Now you weren't there and I sure am glad because what she said on Zoom mm, made me mad. Signify monkey, hush up now, you're a lecturer B. Them dangerous words you saying around me. Monkey, I let you roam my land and do my research for free. You bet not be monkeying around, you see. As far as Professor Hippo go, I'll fix old Slim. I'll tear Professor Hippo limb from limb. Then Professor Lion shook the uni jungle with a mighty roar and took off faster than a grant application due at four. He found Professor Hippo where the ARC grasses grow. I come to punch you, Hippo, in your big old dirty nose. Professor Hippo looked up, 
slid her MacArthur Fellow works of genius to the side. Boy, I don't know you. Go pick on somebody else, your own side, your best ride. Line carried on, as king of land, as more powerful than you. You gonna give me all that water and your little dog too. Then he grabbed his, or rather, then he grabbed her prize fellow, Academy of Silent Science Award. This here a fossa? Well, I's Mufasa, your brand new landlord. Hippo turned, said to her scholarly posse, hold my laureate pen, pin, Challenge accepted, Professor Lyon. May the strongest academic win. Lyon wasn't listening, just clawed and roared something crass. That's when Hippo up and slammed him down on the grass. Professor Lyon hissed and sprang up, drenched from that muddy ground. And that's when Professor Laureate Professor Hippo really went to town. I mean, she whooped that lion for the rest of the day, and I still don't know how lion managed to get away. Back in the smooth water, Professor Hippo wrote an autoethnography about the venture, then shared it at C A E A E R A, even Twitter without censure took weeks for a lion to drag himself home, being more dead than alive. By then, lecturer B. Monkey was on signified overdrive. Monkey looked down, safe from a tree, saying, Woo-wee! What's this beat up mess I done see? Is that you, Professor Lion? Hey, Prof. <laughs> Do tell, cause it said here on Twitter, hippo don't whoop you from head to tail and fare thee well. Well, gave you a scholarly beating that was rough enough. You're supposed to be king of Uniland and get some stuff. You big overgrown pussy cat don't even roar or I'll come down there and whoop you some more. Lecture monkey got to laughing, jiving, jumping round, but her foot missed the limb and she plunged to that ground. Professor Lion jumped on monkey with all four feet. I gonna grind you up monkey into hamburger meat. Lowly lecturer monkey looked up with tears in the eyes. Please, 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 Professor Lyon, royalty of research, I apologize. Oh, please, 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 Professor Lyon, please let me go. And I, I'll get you more data and, and tell you something you really, really want to know. Hmm. Professor Lyon stepped back to hear what monkey had to say. And that's when Lucky Lecturer and Monkey scampered up the tree and got away. What I wanted to tell you, Monkey testified with her hands on chin. If you fool with me, I sick hippo on you again. Professor Lyon just shook his head and said, you think you done play? Well, if you and your monkey friends want to live out the day up there in them trees, you better stay with that signifying play. And that's where monkey swing free away from lion till this day. They say hippo be dean soon with distinguished chairs on land and underwater to make sure she comes out to land at night. Slings dung like Estee Lauder. <sighs> and that's how the uni jungle story be now. But anyone ask you, you didn't 
hear from, excuse me, rather, and, try that again, and, that's how the uni jungle story now be. But if anybody asks you, you didn't hear it from me. Lecture a monkey, enjoy your play in up in there that uni tree, your signifying be a way of surviving at the university. Thank you. So it seems we have moved from the Ig Nobel Awards to Oscar winning category, and I believe that the, the category has just been announced. Dr. Chapman, on behalf of Level Bs of the world, I've doffed my cap. There's nothing more I can do. <laughs> Finally, in this realm of applied humour, we are going to pass the, uh, the signified baton to Emily Gray. And Emily will be talking about her work with hashtag FIS, Feminist Educators Against Sexism, an international feminist collective committed to developing humorous and irrelevant and ir sorry, irreverent interventions into sexisms wherever they lurk. Over to you. Thank you very much. Um, they are irre irrelevant as well as irreverent. Um, I have got a PowerPoint because I'm a big nerd, so I'm going to share that. Um, and before I start, I would also like to acknowledge that the work that we do as FEES, Feminist Educators Against Sexism, is carried out on stolen land in Nam, the land of the Woiwurrung and Bunurung language groups of the Eastern Kulin Nation. And in Borlu, this is Wajuk Noongar Buja. An acknowledging country, we acknowledge that sovereignty was never ceded by Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander peoples across Australia. So who are FEES? We are an interdisciplinary international feminist collective and we're currently co-led by me, Mindy Blaze and Joe Pollitt. And Joe Pollitt is here today, so please, Joe, give everyone a wave. Um, I'm an educational sociologist. Mindy brings a background in gender and education and creative participatory methods. And Joe is an interdisciplinary artist and postdoc research fellow. And her work through improvisation, creative response and feminist theatre making informs her contribution to fees. And we do indeed use a mix of humour, irreverence, um, creative participatory methods and collective action to interrupt and disarm both everyday and institutional sexisms wherever we find them. So as three queer white migrant women, we understand humour as part of a queer lesbian feminist legacy, something that comedian Kate Clinton has labelled humorism. That's humour plus feminism plus anger. And feminist humour has a long and largely ignored history. So it can be found in the activism of UK based feminist collectives from Leeds in the north of England, who would spray paint sexist advertising boards in the 1970s. And because they weren't changed every five minutes in those days, they would stay up for weeks and weeks and weeks. This legacy can also be found in the work of the Lesbian Avengers in the 1990s, who used humour as a way to raise lesbian visibility within a movement that had been dominated by the gaytriarchy and which had largely ignored the contribution that lesbians had made to AIDS activism and care work. More recently, this legacy can be found in the comedy of Australian performers Hannah Gadsby and Zoe coombs ma and in things like the recent TV show Hacks, all of which challenge what it means to be a woman and what it has historically cost women to be understood as funny by broad audiences. So our interventions have mostly been developed um, as a result of uh, personal, professional and political flashpoints. So one of the many recent feminist feminist flashpoints for us was recent events from the cesspit that is Australian politics. So in November 2020, the ABC ran a story drawing from collective evidence that the Attorney General Christian Porter had routinely sexually harassed women he worked with. In March 2020, the story escalated and a historical rape allegation was made. Porter denied this allegation, 
publicly crying and repositioning himself as the victim. Later that month, a formal complaint was made against the Queensland MP Andrew Lamming for alleg allegedly taking upskirt photographs of a woman he worked with. He denied wrongdoing and was sent for three days of empathy training. At the same time that this was ha happening, a former Liberal Party staffer, Brittany Higgins, gave a public account of being sexually harassed at work. And our Prime Minister responded by saying that his wife had a way and had made him understand Higgins's claim through the eyes of their daughters. So women across Australia were enraged, including us, and took to the streets in March for justice rallies across the country under the cry, enough is enough. So fees, we've always worked with the notion that it's the persistence of everyday sexisms across every sphere of life in Australia and everywhere else in the world that creates an environment where sexual harassment and assault are commonplace. And so as a way to bring this knowledge to a non-academic audience, we developed and performed a game show entitled The Fees Wheel of Misfortune. It was a 10 minute performance with two main parts. First, there were games. Fees fact or fiction. Ask the audience to guess whether statements about gender inequality were, in, were fact or fiction. Then speedy solutions for sexisms, where the audience were given 15 seconds to respond to a real life example of everyday sexism. I performed as Rusty Nail, a jaded but enthusiastic game show host. Think Caesar Flickerman meets Murray Hill with co-host Professor Mindy Blaze, because there's not really a better name than that. Um, with Melbourne back in lockdown, I was unable to appear live in person and so performed via Zoom, which offered the show a kind of contemporary COVID specificity. Um, the second part of the show shifted in tone and was an abstract gestural movement sequence with spoken word, which was a response to feminist conceptual artist Martha Rossler's 1975 work, Semiotics of the Kitchen. This part of the show used our wheel of misfortune with the words grind, pinch, shake, pound, toss, which spun to the soundtrack of the words being repeated at increasing speed. So Mindy gave a gestural performance that mined these words and we deliberately used words that could be used in cookery, which was another rod, uh, nod to Rossler's work. However, these words have sexual connotations as well as being words that are used to sexualize in sexist ways. So humour was a key part of the show and Rusty Nail invited the audience to have fun with a middle aged queer lesbian feminist. So literally the last person on earth who's supposed to be funny, as well as self depreciation, the fr framing of Rusty in this way, nods to the lateral violence in denying groups of people, feminists, lesbians, a sense of humour, especially in contexts where a sense of humour is seen as a personality trait, positive personality trait, like in Australia. So for us, humour and irreverence allows us to stay with the trouble, to quote Donna Haraway, and by challenging sexism through humour, irreverence and collective action, we highlight the inequalities, absurdities and dreary everydayness of sexisms. And I'm just going to show you a clip of our show just to finish, hopefully it plays OK. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It's Saturday night and time for feeds. Feminist Educators Against Sexism, Wheel of Misfortune. I am your host, Rusty Nail. If you don't play, you can't win. And as well as winning prizes, we hope our show makes you think about how you spin the wheel every day. The lack of women epidemiologists involved in COVID-19 research means that there may be gendered effects of the virus that we do not know. Fact. Thanks.
Thank you so much. I'm just going to unspotlight you, although you deserve the spotlight gloriously. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, Dr. Peter Murray and I have been laughing uproariously behind the safety of our um, muted mic and our off cameras. But now we um, would like to ask all three of our presenters to turn their cameras on and receive a collective ovation from us and the audience. And the great thing about um, working with funny academics is they have a sense of timing. So we have um, finished um, with uh, the allotted uh, 10 minutes for Q&A. So um, we do notice that um, nobody has taken up our invitation to write their thesis or um, proposed thesis in a line. So we are setting that for you as homework. And um, you can send the results to uh, jollygoodfellows at gmail.com. This Gmail address doesn't exist, but um, it, it's, it's an attempt to give you a deadline to encapsulate your research in one funny one-liner. But this is great news and Kerry is timing you. He, the, his, his timers exist around, around your orbit, whether you see them or not. Um, but that's quite good because we don't have to go into that then. We can instead um, go into a discussion um, and um, go to any um, questions from the Q&A. So what I'm going to do, um, Dr Murray, is I'm going to get you to um, get the ball rolling with our um, facilitators, while I, I mean, with our panellists, while I look for any questions in the chat. Right. Well, that was a remarkable little lineup of applied humour across a range of different intents. And what struck me uh, amongst um, many things was the, the role of humour as a form of, of activism, as a means of resistance, uh, and as a way of pushing back against the tropes and the stereotypes that are so often uh, used in the academy to keep people in their place. So I would love to hear from um, from any of the presenters first about how humour first entered your work work life. Was this part of your research from the get go, Denise Chapman, or was this something that has just crept up on you like that monkey uh, <laughs> and surprised you along the way? Well, I have to say that it certainly crept up on me, I think, um, much like menopause um, and, um, you know, joyfully crept up on me. And um, but yeah, I, I think um, I don't know. I, I think I grew up with family members that spoke in metaphors all, you know, and I didn't really realize it until coming here to Australia. And I'd say something to folks and people were like, huh, you know. <laughs> So, but you know, I think you know the critical autoethnography conference was the first time that I really felt the sense of being able to um, to sh reshape this. Excuse me, as an early childhood person, saying a bad word is hard for me. Reshape this shit, shit <laughs> that's around me into a fortress uh, where I get to 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 play. Thank you. Uh, have we any questions in the chat? All we have in the chat is love, which, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not averse. And um, I was also um, uh, uh, pending Dr. Emily Collier has offered a piece of weasel speak that we forgot, which is the legacy hand. So thank you. That's going straight to the pool room. And by pool room, I mean the list. Um, so if anybody does have any questions, whack them into the chat um, or feel free just to um, raise your hand and then we can call it a legacy hand hilariously or just open your mic. Otherwise, um, we I can. Have a question. Uh, oh, Dr. Murray. Um, Emily Gray, could you tell us a little bit about how humour has progressed the cause of fees? How do you know that you are ignobling for impact? Um, well, we it's sort of been an evolution from we started out just three of us um, and doing kind of pop up performances at conferences, but we've always used comedy. So one of the first things we did was um, we got we we. We ran workshops and got people to give accounts of sexist experiences that they'd had at work and turned it into a comedy show with one liners that were read. So it wasn't funny. 
and it went on and on. It was odd. Denise saw it. I think it was like 15 minutes long and it was just, you know, awful experience after awful experience with canned laughter. Um, so I guess we've always been really interested in playing with that idea of, you know, one, you should have a sense of humour if someone says something sexist to you. And two, that, um, you know, feminists aren't supposed to have a sense of humour. So let's be funny. And it's also a way for us to draw people in and not to sort of, and to kind of get people on board with what we, the messages that we want to impart in a way that's, that brings people in, that you can have a laugh about it. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> it does. It, it makes perfect sense. Um, so uh, uh, we are we are having some um, one line theses coming in. I love saying theses. I'm just going to let, let that one hang. But um, I wanted to ask Kerry, have you ever had, had a situation where you have, um, you know, brought comedy to the table as a way of, um, you know, um, uh, trying to promote some engagement with ideas and it really hasn't worked? Um, yeah, yeah. But ironically, that's where I think it works the best. You know, it's actually it's the failed comic that is actually probably the funniest as long as they're not, you know, as long as it's not too kind of over dramatic in how they're failed. But I, I think it's interesting, the kind of idea of uh, I think it's there's there's a, a fairly recent and it's fairly general kind of theory around um, around humor about this idea of benign violation theory. So simultaneously perceiving something as being threatening, but at the same time as being benign. And that, that this kind of like uh, overflow of, of residual energy that your system, you know, very, I don't, won't go into the biology of it, but the, but as sort of a surfeit of, um, of kind of adrenal function and everything sort of overflows. But in the process of that, there's a whole lot of stuff that happens neurologically that allows for links to be made that previously weren't made. So, so I think that in terms of a, a, the possibilities of information transfer and not, you know, and this is kind of, I'm really devaluing everything by calling it information transfer. It's like, you know, it's no longer knowledge, it's just data, you know, we're just pro programmable kind of things. But, but the, the point, the thing that I was saying before though, is this um, about the, the kind of, you know, that's, that it's actually like, you know, like, like language is technology. Like, so basically, you know, we're using, we, we used to, you know, like we use words to communicate ideas, but, you know, playing with, you know, metaphors and props and various things, I think enable a, a, an additional or augmented capacity for transferring ideas. And that's, that's probably the upshot of, of what, and I don't know if it's really just answered your question, but like, I think that, yeah, the, the like you probably, those that read between the lines, my the introduction that you, that you read is pretty much slipping on, the, the banana skin to fall on the ground and when you fall on the ground you're actually probably more connected to the reality of the world that's achieving that is actually a very like a humble hu, hu, like a humble thing to be doing you know and we, humil humiliating thing we have some late breaking questions and we also have some contributions from the participants so contributions to knowledge even so what, just go with this question first because it's a butte one how do you feel presenting something funny in an online environment like this is it more challenging than live yeah. not sure. <laughs> I'm, yeah. I'm not sure what live is anymore what's, okay. what's live these days yeah. Yeah. And we do have some wonderful um, summations of certain theses, uh, some in progress and some uh, complete. Would you like to share this one? Sure. Feminist writers have always liked to mess with shit and hasn't really changed. I desperately hope I can say something new about it, but probably not. Good luck with that one. <laughs> And here we have the thesis, music beyond gameplay, motivators for the consumption of video game soundtracks, or people hung up with their childhoods, listen to chip music together while companies make money off them. Sounds like an excellent use of that scholarship. Um, and in terms of this um, lovely question that came before about um, performing, performing funniness in the online environment, I think, um, 
we or as, as Kerry says, it's um, what is live anymore anyway, but also I find it's extraordinary how used to I have got to the fact that I can't get the feedback I normally would. Um, and maybe students have trained me well, but um, um, otherwise I just trust that um, you're all there, um, you know. In fact, it's probably better because I can imagine you're all just pissing yourselves and um, I don't, <laughs> if, if you're not, you are in my mind. <laughs> Um, one more, Emily, I have to share yours because it's just too beautiful. Miss, are you bisexual? The reproduction of heteronormativity within schools and the negotiation of lesbian, gay and bisexual teachers' private and professional worlds. Or the kids will call you and everything else gay. Genius. And on a, that gay note, I think it's almost time to uh, wind things up. I think it's time to wind things up. So just thanks once again to this panel. Just couldn't have asked for more. Exceeded expectations on your career and performance evaluation. Um, uh, you, you make me happy with the work you do. I really want to um, thank Nonfiction Lab for accepting this tip, um, even though it probably uh, the abstract made no sense and probably seemed a bit risky. But it's our, our pleasure to um, end the year and end the series with um, uh, introducing you to these uh, the work of these fine, fine people. If you didn't know it already, and uh, we are, we have every good reason to believe that the Nonfiction Lab will be back next year to bring you more of this kind of. Uh, brain meddling and and fish water pushing and pulling uh, tipping and uh, language has deserted me now so I will hand the microphone back to Professor Carlin to bring things to a close. Thank you so much professors all professors one and all for a fabulous um, way to finish our year and uh, we look forward to seeing you all after a good lie down over the summer. Bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. I have to go to another meeting immediately. <laughs> <laughs>